So, Nancy, do you watch The Crown? So, I did start watching The Crown, actually, with my mom when we were on vacation. Nice. It's very, that kind of, you know. You were watching TV on vacation? When I was visiting them in the evening, you know, oh, okay. kind of there Netflix. Go. It's good, though. I really like it. Me, too. I didn't think I would, but I really enjoy it. Although, I have to watch it with subtitles. Really? It's really? really hard for me to understand the English accents. Really? Also, Game of Thrones. I had to. I started watching that with subtitles, and the entire show changed for me because I was like, I can now understand. <laughs> I could 50% see percent more. Yeah. If you haven't read the books, I can totally understand how that Game of Thrones <laughs> might be. Really I confusing. actually, I lived <laughs> with um, I lived with um, one of my brothers and uh, sister in laws for like six months or something, and they watch everything with subtitles on, and it bothered me so much. Like I couldn't do it for a while, and now I do it, and now my partner hates me because of it. She's <laughs> like, turn us, turn the subtitles. Yeah, off. that's what my mom does. I guess are they like seventy five? No, Did your brother and sister. Well. <laughs> no, they're like your age. Yeah, it's just they like just like subtitles. I should tell my parents that because they can't really hear very well. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in a manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hamlin. And I'm Nancy Bompy. And I'm Lauren LaPuma. Ooh, hi Lauren. And this is Third Pod from the Sun, Centennial Edition. So we're actually talking about The Crown because this whole episode today is all started when I saw an episode of The Crown. Huh. Do you remember the one about the Great Smog? Did you see that one yet? I didn't see that one. Um, well, you should definitely watch this one. And for those listening, you should watch it too. It's very interesting. So in the early 1950s in London, in the beginning of December of 1952, there was this episode that is referred to now as the London Great Smog. And so London's always been a very smoggy place. But um, there's this one time where the smog just over the city would not dissipate. It was so thick and it persisted for over five days that people literally could not see their feet. Like when you looked down, that's wow. how foggy it was. Yeah. What does that do to like someone's body? Bad stuff. <laughs> Bad stuff. And that's actually what we're going to hear about today. Didn't you say it was yeah. like pea soupy? Yeah. They called them pea soupers when this would happen because uh. it looked like pea soup. That's gross. It's very gross. But yeah, it actually killed a lot of people. Thousands of people died from inhaling these toxic fumes. It was fumes from all the coal burning power plants and the coal fires. Remember, it was wintertime. It was really cold. People were burning you know, fires in their mm. houses to stay warm. There were diesel buses. So I saw this and I got really interested in it and I wanted to find out more. And I actually found out that there is there was a very similar event that happened, but on a much much smaller scale right here in our neck of the woods in this town called Denora, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. That's where I'm from. That is where you're from. Oh. Where are you from again in Pennsylvania? I'm from a tiny little village of less than 700 people called Munster. Like the cheese? Uh, no, like the Munsters. Like, there's no E. Like Herman Munster? Like Herman, yes. I do like Munster cheese, though. It's pretty good. It's delicious, yeah. But have you ever heard of this town called Denora? I have not, actually. Well, um, we brought it up on the map here. Let's, uh -huh. look. Let's see. It's kind it's of south southeast. of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, no, so I, I'm surprised I haven't because like, I'm from that partish of the state. Have you been to Periopolis? Uh, no. I've Yeah. So <laughs> we, now we just started looking at a map of names and realized there's a bunch of funny names. in Pennsylvania has like yeah interesting town names. There's Probably place... all the states, but yes, this is fun. Yeah. There's a place called Smock. Smock. I know. I like smock. Oh, and um, moon. Oh, moon. Oh, yeah, moon. It's very um space themed. It's it's a township outside of Pittsburgh. Is it seriously like no, they're, they no. embrace it? <laughs> oh, 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 oh! I thought you knew. That. <laughs> There's a place called Bentleyville. Sweet. Yeah. You have to drive a Bentley if you live there. Bum 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 bum. <laughs> The more you know. know. Oh, yes. So back to Denora. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the reason we're talking about Denora, like I said, is there was this other really horrible smog event that happened in Denora, Pennsylvania in 1948. And so when I was researching um, this episode, both the London event and the Denora event, um, I came across Deborah Davis. And she is a doctor. She's a toxicologist and an epidemiologist. And she has studied both of these events in detail. But interestingly, she actually grew up in the town of Denora. <laughs> I'm Dr. Deborah Davis. I'm an epidemiologist and toxicologist. I'm also a writer of popular books, including When Smoke Ran Like Water, that tells the story of the London and Denora killer smogs. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into you know, medicine and epidemiology. Well, I grew up in the town called Denora, and it uh, was a very small steel town, working class. It was the largest nail mill in the world. Oh, wow. It, was, it had one of the largest zinc uh, smelters in the world at the time. The town of Denora 
burned more coal in a single day through the, because of the mill than the entire city of Pittsburgh. And uh, I never heard about the word pollution when I was living there. And when I went away to school, uh, I was in high school, I went to the university, and I learned that there was a town called Denora that had been polluted. And I came home and I said to my mother, Mom, was there another town with the same name as ours? And she said, why are you asking? I said, well, I read in a book at school that there was a town called Donora, and it was polluted. Was our town polluted? And she motioned you know, for me to sit down. And um, she said, well, do you remember how the sun didn't shine for days at, at a time? I said, yeah. She said, remember how we used to have to clean the walls? Uh, every couple months, we'd have to clean the soot off the walls. I said, sure. She said, well, I guess today they'd call that pollution, but back then it was just a living. I remember that our games were the games that you play when there's no grass. So, for example, regularly we would get on the top of a little hill and slide down because there was no grass growing on it, so you could use the hill as a slide. Wow. This is before there were playgrounds, okay? And there were certain areas where you could grow tomatoes, and there were areas where nobody tried to grow anything. And now I realize those were areas where the plumes were uh, strongest. Mm -hmm. And zinc plume in particular, uh, zinc is pretty toxic to plants. So years later, when I came back from my grandfather's funeral, I was shocked that the hills I had slid down and the grounds I'd played on were full of sumac trees, which grow very quickly, and grass. And I realized I grew up without much green in many places, and we just took it for granted, mm -hmm. just the way it was. Wow, Denora sounds lovely. <laughs> I'm sure it was until this big smog event happened in mm. 1948. So even spookier, it happened right before Halloween. Ooh. Yeah, this smog rolled in and didn't dissipate for a couple of days and right around the end of October um, in 1948. I was an infant at the time. My mother just thought it was a little smokier than usual. What the, did, what the did football it look game like? went on? Really? They couldn't see. The other side could not see when the football went up in the air where it was going to come down. Settles down on the industrial town of Donora, Pennsylvania, and brings with it mysterious death. Residents have difficulty in breathing the murky air. Twenty die. Four hundred others are stricken with respiratory ailments. Oxygen tents care for sufferers in the town's community center, transformed into a hospital. Investigations are launched. A local zinc plant suspected of emitting poison smoke is closed down. Rain brings relief, but an epidemic of pneumonia is feared in the wake of Donora's deadly plague of smog. You were, you know, you were too young, but what, you know, from the other people who've described it, what did it look like? What People could not see their feet. Um, people um, kept on their normal activities. When they went up to the top of the hill, there was less smoke down. Of, uh, but this, this particular smoke just wouldn't go away. And I interviewed people who described watching a coal-fired steam engine discharge this black plume of smoke, which would normally go up and away. And instead of going up and dissipating, it went around straight over the horizon and dropped right back down. The Halloween parade went on, but they didn't need to make it any more spookier because it was already spooky enough with all the smoke. Yeah. Right? The smoke just got denser and denser. And after a while, people started to hear people had gotten really sick. About a third of the town became ill. Now, you have to understand, Denor was a small town. Normally, nobody would die. How many yeah. people about? At the time I lived there, maybe 20,000, maybe a, few, a little bit less. Normally, that nobody would die. And if somebody died, it was a big deal. The first thing that happened is the funeral homes ran out of caskets. Oh, my God. And the florists ran out of flowers. The pharmacies ran out of drugs. So what about anyone in your family? Were they affected? Uh, yes. My grandmother had one of her many heart attacks. Um, she was like a lot of women her age. Um, they were considered old ladies in their 50s who were in bed much of the time. 
because they weren't well. And they weren't well because their hearts had been damaged by the heavy pollution. I saw my grandmother have heart attacks. In fact, her heart attacks were so common that she, next to her bed, there was a welder's tank of air because the only treatment known for heart attacks back then was to put people in what they called an oxygen tent, and they would tent oxygen over uh, the bed and try to get the person to have access to more oxygen. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't die then. She didn't die until her 25th heart attack. And she'd had so many of them, and I'd seen so many of them, that I couldn't believe she wasn't going to come back, but that time she didn't. What was it like for you watching that? It was scary. Dr. Levin would come. He was the town doctor, and he, of course he made house calls. And my mother would drag me along. I was the oldest at that point. There were, I think there were two others, because I could be helpful, and uh, I... I remember my grandmother would often would would vomit and would hold her chest and would be moaning. And we would all just wait for Dr. Levin to come and administer something. I think that uh, there were so many people like my grandmother in that town people who had been full of energy. My grandmother was legendary for having been the first woman to hand crank a Model T. Wow. She would drive, before the Pennsylvania Turnpike existed, she would drive with her five children to Atlantic City in the summer times. I never knew her when she had that level of vigor and uh, strength. I heard the stories from my mother, but uh, she was a very uh, smart lady. And, of course, like most grandchildren, I adored her. So it was quite quite a loss. So why, why was this particular incident so bad, the smog incident? Like, what was happening? Well, actually, it happened it had to do with the weather. So there is this weird weather phenomenon. Well, I guess it's not weird. To me, it's weird because I had never heard of it before. Um, but it's called an anticyclone. And so I wanted to know more about this. So I spoke to an atmospheric scientist. Her name is Sarah Benish. And she explained to me what it was and why this happened at this particular time. My name is Sarah Benich, and I am a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science at the University of Maryland. Uh, So I study air quality and air pollution transport uh, in China. So an anticyclone is a a type of weather system where the surface pressure is greater at its center than the air is around it. It's basically a more technical term for a high pressure system. Um, So if you've, you know, ever watched the news or like looked at a weather map, those are the blue H's on on those maps. Um, And so these systems are associated with with falling air and clockwise circulation in in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, And so because this air is sinking uh, in these high pressure, these anti-cyclone areas, it's it's suppressing the the upward motion that you need to create things like clouds and precipitation. And so for this reason, anti-cyclones are generally associated with, with fair weather or good weather. Uh, so this means uh, like low clouds, no precipitation. It's it's dry. The weather's stagnant. There's there's low winds, um, and so these really create uh, some some good conditions for air pollution to build up and then just stay right where it is and not be transported other where other places where um, it could you know be diluted or rained out or things like that. The Denora, Pennsylvania, and the London smog episode were were particularly important because these were multi-day anti-cyclones. So air was really just stuck where it was for multiple days and there was no precipitation, no rain. So it, it didn't have anywhere else to go because of the, the local emissions and, and the chemistry associated with that. There was just a, a, a bad uh, catch 22. There was nothing to, to be done at that point. 
So now back to Devra. So she grew up there in this town. Obviously, there was this incident, but she had actually ended up being a scientist. I mean, mm-hmm. studying this thing. Right. So she was, you know, very affected by this when she got older and she really wanted to look into it and find out what exactly happened and what was the actual part of the smog that was so toxic to people. She became a doctor. She became a toxicologist and she looked into this in detail and went actually back to look for all those records from the people who had died and who were sick during the 48 event. mills shut down my family joined thousands of others leaving and went to the big city of Pittsburgh and uh, years and years later when I was in graduate school and I was doing my postdoc at Johns Hopkins University I became very interested in the science of epidemiology which is the study of the patterns of disease made by people in time and space and I began to try to map what had happened in Donora for years it was called a an act of God, a freak of weather. But I subsequently did further research and determined it was not just a freak of weather. What we found is that where the deaths were in Donora was within a few hundred feet of the highest levels of pollution of that mill Mm -hmm. during this particular episode. That's where all the 20 deaths that occurred within five days. Even though you inhale an air pollutant, air pollutants are a combination of gases and particles. Once they are inhaled, however, both the ultrafine particles and the the gases, obviously, get into the lung. The smaller they are, smaller than 2.5 microns, they can get all the way into the lung. So once they get in through the nose, and let's say they're 2.5 or smaller, nanoparticle size, They can then get into the lung and into the bloodstream. And once they get into the bloodstream, they can go anywhere into the body. There still is a debate about what part of the pollution was the most toxic, if you will. Mm -hmm. We know that sulfur dioxide forms acid when you, in the presence of water, but that's not likely to be the culprit. That's not going to kill people. It's going to make them cough, and it's going to have a kind of noxious odor to it. Um, I believe that the most likely culprit was the formation of a highly reactive fluoride gas. That's what I suspect. And I suspect that based on some evidence that was found in the air conditioning filters that were analyzed years later, Mm -hmm. where there were some residues consistent with that. And Donora, you see, was along the Monongahela Valley, along a horseshoe bend, where it was given to these inversions uh, where the cold air would sit on top of the hot and it couldn't get out. But so were other towns in the Mon Valley. But only Donora had the zinc plant. All the other towns had coke ovens and steel mills, but only Donora had this huge zinc plant. I suspect that there was something in the process of zinc smelting, uh, particularly fluoride. So you take sand and you take fluor spar, that's calcium fluoride, and you combine them and you get a highly reactive fluorine gas. Mm-hmm. And I believe it was the gas that, that caused this uh, problem. Because when I looked at the autopsies and I looked at some of the pathology, the lungs of the people from Donora that you could look at looked like they had um, suffocated, just like those from poison gas warfare, where also they used a kind of fluoride gas for some of the poison gases. Oh, my God. That's horrifying. Um, The official record for Donora said 20 deaths. Well, now I know there were far more than that. Okay, so Lauren, you started this whole, I guess, journey of discovery down this rabbit hole because of the uh, the Great London Smog. Right, of 1952. What made it great? Well, it was just, it was really horrible. Thousands of people died. So a bad great. Bad, yeah, exactly. <laughs> bad great, terrible great. Um, so, but actually officials from London, they knew that something like this 
was a possibility that it could potentially happen and that if an anticyclone came and stayed over the city for a long time it could be really bad and cause a lot of deaths and so Dever told me actually about how um, some London officials actually went to Denora to investigate what happened with that smog event. <laughs> London immediately sent a team of investigators to Denora within weeks of its happening. Oh, the Denora smog? Yes. And they went to the town, to the, and the people that investigated the Denora smog were from the National Security Agency of the United States. Uh -huh. And the people investigating from London were also from the Security Bureau. Why did they go? I mean, did they just, they knew that this could, was the kind of thing that could happen in London too? There were those who were well aware that this possibility existed, and they were in senior positions in government. And that report sat in a drawer, unread and ignored, until after the London smog had hit. The London report said, if an episode like Denora ever hits a town like ours, we will have thousands of deaths. So London, how many people actually died there? I mean, from this. Well, so in the early 50s, the official government report, their official report said about three to 4,000 people died. Oh, wow. Um, but De Deborah went back and looked at this later on, and she'll tell you all about it, um, found out that actually a lot more people probably mm. died, and hundreds of thousands of people were sickened from it, from you're breathing in toxic coal fumes, sulfur dioxide, like, you know, sulfuric acid, tons of bad stuff. Um, so... Dever wanted to go back and look at this, so she and a colleague went back and they found that a lot more people died than the British government officially thought. And so their, what, their government's official explanation in the beginning was that there had also been a flu epidemic. Because remember, it's wintertime, you know, it's typical flu season. Um, and they thought that the flu had made people more vulnerable to the effects of the smog. Mm -hmm. But when Dever and her colleague Michelle Bell, when they went back and looked at this, they found that that was not the case. How did they deal with that in The Crown? Um, well, you have to watch it. <laughs> um, but actually, she told me The Crown was very historically accurate. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Michelle Bell was a doctoral student at Johns Hopkins. And I had finished my postdoc and was at the National Academy of Sciences. We got this idea that there ought to be a little bit more that you could come up with, because London, unlike Denora, had a record of keeping data for public health for many years. So we did some digging, and we came across a, a sole practitioner, well, kind of analogous to a country doc, but in London, who kept assiduous records of every patient he ever saw for 40 years, every day. And so what we were able to show is that there was, when his record of treatment of people sick during the time of the killer smog, he had no unusual increase in reported flu deaths or flu cases that came into his office. And he, all his flu cases were confirmed over the period of 40 years. There was not an unusual number of them during that time. Every year, railways, factories, and private homes exude two and a half million tons of smoke. Well, we put it all way. together in an analysis, and then we went back and we noted something else. And we looked at the daily death rate all the way into s several months out after this episode. Now, the London killer smog was in early December of 1952 when 4,000 people died. And it was the government's position was that that episode ended by mid-December. We noted that the death rate remained 50% above normal all the way into the spring. Wow. And so we calculated just with plain old numbers what the data actually show, which is that there were 12,000 deaths more than normal. Now, look, London's a huge city. It still is. It was then one of the, the world's largest cities. So it was normal that you would have hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths over a short period of time. But to have this many uh, deaths occur in such a small period of time was extraordinary. And what was the British government's official, what was their number for it before you guys found the 12,000? 3,000. Wow. Wow. 
So this is four times more than the official explanation. Now, Good. what was unique about the London smog, right? Because London had smogs for hundreds of years. They even named this clothing line, London Fog. What was unique in Denora, I think, was the zinc plant. What was unique in London were the diesel buses because the summer before the London smog hit was when they first introduced diesel buses in, into transportation in London. And it was the double-decker diesel buses with the diesel fumes combined with a million smoke-fired chimneys that I believe accounted for the unique toxicity of that London fog. Every year, railways, factories, and private homes exude two and a half million tons of smoke over England and Wales. New and the reason I think that is the case is that Jerry Abraham, a very bright pathologist from upstate New York, actually dissected lungs from London 50 years later. And he was able to show inside the lung and inside the lymph black schmutz like you would get from diesel. In fact, the amount of soot taken in by one person in a day would cover a threepenny bit. <coughs> so you see, it was a toxic soup. The diesel particles on the gas inhaled into the lung with a, a, in a form uh, and a density that had never existed before that created this very deadly, dense smoke that I think created the deadly fumes that affected so many and ultimately shut down traffic. People could not see their feet. The great fog of London has been the chief topic in the south of Britain, its result being, of course, a great hold-up and vast inconvenience for millions. Traffic in London was completely at a standstill on many occasions. In there, fact, I the tell a story in my book, water. When Smoke Ran Like Water, of a, um, a guy can't find his way home, so he hears the tap, tap, tap of a blind man and he, followed, he, he asked them if he could take him by the hand to find his way home. Wow. Wow. So, and how long did the London smog event last? Supposedly 10 days. It started to ebb, uh, as is most of these things, the weather and the winds change. But remember, London wasn't on a hill. It was just a slight valley of the Thames. But again, this 100 feet or so difference was all it took. These are all obviously ter like absolutely terrible catastrophic events. Yeah. Uh, but I assume, or I'm at least hoping, that there was like some ultimate good that came out of this, like regulation-wise. Yeah, it, sadly, you know, it always takes a tragedy to have some good something good come out of it. But um, eventually, this these two events were really the catalyst for clean air regulations, you know, in the second half of the 20th century, mm. and actually helped to establish the EPA here in the U.S. In the beginning, in 1955, the United States passed a, a clean air law that basically just gave the Department of Health and Human Services the right to gather data, because it's always been a lot easier to study something than to do something about it, right? That's our tradition all over the world. Let's right. study the problem, okay? So then finally in 1970, under the leadership of Richard Nixon, there was a real impetus to regulate pollutants in the air. The first air pollution standards in the United States and probably among in the world were set by California under a Republican governor um, because people in California were ri literally... Uh, rioting in the streets, demanding cleaner air in the 1950s, suburban housewives with gas masks on. Wow. And so California, they knew that there was something going on. People, people were getting sicker and sicker, and they demanded something. So California set standards. Richard Nixon comes from California. He sees the writing on the wall. He didn't care much for the environment. In fact, he used to light, light a fire in the White House in the summer because he liked the homey feeling of the fireplace. <laughs> But he knew an issue that was good politically. So on January 1st, he said, we must protect our environment. It's now or never. And that April, we had the first Earth Day. And wow. he was ahead of it. And so he starts, uh, appoints an EPA, which did not exist before then. And they take parts of agencies from all over the rest of the government and put them together into this 
EPA, and um, they start to go about um, not just studying the problem, but actually setting standards. And they set standards for uh, sulfur, nitrogen, um, volatile materials, and lead, um, and start a whole program of air pollution controls. And the states have to implement the, the, the uh, policies, but the feds basically set what the levels are. Mm-hmm. And that st- all came from those dreadful episodes of Denora and London. Clean Air Act was really the, the forefront into into controlling our air, at least in the United States. Right now, uh, the state of the science is a little bit challenging because people, um, it's it's a, a real highly political issue. You know, uh, people don't want to be told that their business or their um, industry is emitting too much. Um, And so we have really helpful uh, clean air legislation with with the Clean Air Act in 1970, but uh, more work needs to be done to make these regulations even more strict in order to protect human health, you know, control agriculture, um, things like that. While air pollution uh, is very much seen, at least in a political standpoint, as a local problem or a statewide problem, uh, pollution knows no boundaries. It, it's it's going to move. It's going to uh, go where it wants to. Um, and so I think in the next round of regulations need to be more focused on a regional and global uh, assessment of, of air pollution. You know, we have uh, studies that show Asian outflow hitting California and Washington and Oregon. It's not uh, like a frequent thing, but like other other countries are going to pollute other countries. But I think there's going to be a need for some global co- cooperation and even just uh, thinking outside the box on, on things like energy and, um, you know, like not like historically these these coal burning power plants were were the way to go for energy. Um, but acid rain has proved that maybe it's not. So um, really thinking out our, uh, the future of our, of our energy and of our investments and how it will affect its people and its, um, its crops and agriculture and economy, I think is going to be uh, pretty important. I, I keep thinking of Deborah, this kind of, um, like the fact that she grew up in this area and then went back to like save it almost or at least learn from like the past and regulation you know so you know who she reminds me of you no not me <laughs> <laughs> no no um uh rachel carson oh, right yeah, so absolutely. like it's so, like mm-hmm. with with De- De- uh devra it was like the smog and pollution rachel carson was pesticides both from pennsylvania mm-hmm. and centian mm-hmm. i don't know i figured that's like a I'd, I'd like that comparison no it's not me yeah Let's i mean see. what have you done for your hometown of munster Shane? i i've talked about it on an internationally listened to podcast there you go, <laughs> there you, go. <laughs> you put munster on the map i did, I did. everyone go google munster <laughs> okay folks that's all from third pod from the sun centennial edition thanks so much to lauren for bringing us this story and to Deborah and sarah for sharing their work with us uh, this podcast was produced by Lauren and mixed by Robin Murray and John Shiner. And if you want to learn more about the Denora and London smog events, you can watch The Crown or you can read Deborah's book, When Smoke Ran Like Water. And of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this podcast. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and you can find new episodes wherever you get your podcast or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. And uh, we're continuing this on, so be on the lookout for more Centennial episodes to come. As well as our regular episodes. (laughs) And thanks all. We'll see you next time.